of the Czech uh, computer science computer science community. It's our aim somehow to, to in, uh, get involved everybody who is good in the country for into our institute. Now, we are very happy that we are actually located in this building. This is uh, this is one of the nicest, maybe the nicest building of the of the Charles University. It's sort of paradox that the youngest science, uh, uh, which is uh, of all, which is uh, computer science, is uh, occupying one of the oldest buildings of the of the, of the faculty. We hope that we can survive here, although we are under increasing pressure of the administration. We somehow would like to confiscate it for their own purposes, but somehow, so far we are, we are fighting uh, successful. I, now, uh, this is, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, speak too much. Actually, if you want to see something, uh, we did something strange in the day, in the conference materials, uh, uh, we, we put a uh, flash uh, stick uh, uh, with, uh, which is containing the movie. And, uh, and then actually it's containing trailer of the movie and it's containing uh, a movie which is a full, full movie, about 20 minutes. Actually the movie we somehow, I wrote a script for the movie and uh, we, it's a professional made and, uh, and it's uh, related to, to the Honorable Dr. Negri which he began to address a Garebi. I'm sure that some of, maybe some of you know who is uh, address a Garebi who did some fundamental work in the theory of computing. And, and particularly, this is very nice to think about that, that we organize it uh, uh, this year because there is another anniversary, not, uh, not only of Andre getting this year an uh, Apple Prize, but it's uh, a touring year. And so it's, uh, it's very nice to organize uh, many places in the world. Uh, people are remember, remembering it, and uh, I think this is, we can be the best on the occasion of it. So welcome to Prague. I'm very happy that you are here, that you, so many of you come. It's a nice to have that this is anniversary 25th meeting of, uh, of this. Uh, so let's hope it will be the start of music. Enjoy that. And now our keynote speaker, uh, Matt, who really doesn't need any introduction to this group, is the person who is the first author of GCC and the starter of the whole free software movement, Richard Small. Hello. I want to put this meeting in context because people involved in working on some part of a large project focus most of their attention on how to do that part. Naturally, they have to. But in the process, they can forget about what it's all part of and why. So this is about why. Why do we have GCC? Why do we have GDB? Why do we have the videos. Why? What's the why why did I write those things? Well, it's part of something much bigger, namely the GNU operating system. Now most of the time when people you talk about the GNU operating system nowadays, they don't say GNU, they call it Linux, which is a mistake. Please help set them straight. Of course, Linux is one component of the system as we generally use it. So, if you want to give Mr. Torvald some credit, call it GNU plus Linux. But you're part of the GNU part. So, stand up for giving us credit too. Call it GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux. But why have the GNU system? To make it possible to use a computer in freedom. Most operating systems that have existed were developed uh, for technical motivations or commercial motivations. GNU is an operating system that was developed for ethical motivations as a fight for freedom. But what's the freedom involved? Well, with software there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It can't be any other way. If the users have certain essential freedoms, then they have effective control over the program and what it does when they use it. And that's the way it should be. 
So what are those freedoms? Well, it turns out there are four of them. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source of the program and change it so it does your computing the way you wish. These two freedoms give users individually control. So one user has control over the program, but it turns out that's not enough. First of all, because millions of users don't know how to program, they don't know how to exercise freedom one and study and change the source code. But even if you know that, of course, you're too busy to study all the source code of the Bidu slash Linux system. There's so much of it. No one person could read it all, let alone make the changes that she wants in all those programs. So individual control is not enough. We need collective control too. For that, we need two more freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to distribute exact copies to others. And freedom three is the freedom to distribute modified versions to others. Again, you do it when you wish. None of these freedoms is, a, is compulsory. You're free to do these things if you wish. So with freedom zero, you're free to run the program as you wish. But if you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. <laughs> you're also free not to run it. And likewise with the others, you, you don't have to study and change the source code. You can use the program just as you got it. You don't have to distribute copies. You do it when you feel like it. And if you've made a modified version, you don't have to distribute copies. You can run it privately. But the point is, these four freedoms are necessary so the users have both individual and collective control. What does collective control mean? It means that any group of users who choose to use a common version have collectively control over that version. So it's not just collective control at the level of all society, which would require some sort of elections for them all to decide what's going to go in that version. No, you can participate in any group if you wish. And that group that exercises collective control. <clears throat> so, if the users have these freedoms, then the program is distributed in an ethical way and it leads to an ethical social system. One that respects freedom and community. But if the users don't have these freedoms, then they don't control the program, so the program controls them. And there's always some entity that controls the program. And through it, controls them. So, in effect, any non-free program is an instrument of unjust power. Non-free or proprietary software is an injustice, inherently an injustice and should not exist at all. And that's what we're fighting for. The users must control their computing, not someone else using it to control them. Now you heard someone say that code is law. Larry Lessig says he didn't come up with that phrase. I can't. He said who it was, and it was someone I hadn't heard of. So, but it's not always true. It's true, except in the case where you're using free software and you control it. Then it's not like law is imposed on you. Then it's just part of your life and you control it, which is the way it should be. Non-free software today is like laws written non-democratically and imposed on you by some powerful entity. And our goal is to take away its power. So that's what the GNU system exists for. In 1983, when I thought of these ideas in a rudimentary form, I didn't know how to express them as well as I just expressed them today, but I wanted to make freedom a real possibility, not just a theoretical goal, and I knew how to do that. First, we needed a free operating system because the computer won't do anything without an operating system. If you only use free software and there's no free operating system, you don't do any computing. 
well, that's not victory. That's fleeing into exile as your homeland is occupied. That's, well, it's better than not fleeing, perhaps, but it's not the goal. The goal is to bring freedom to your, to your world, to your land. So I had to write a free software operating system, and that meant every piece had to be free software. I decided to make it Unix-like, because Unix had various technical advantages, such as it was a portable design. And lots of people knew how to use it. If I made a Unix compatible system, lots of people would be able to switch easily to different technical advantages. So I decided on that technical design. <clears throat> the other main design decision I made was to ignore 16-bit computers because it would have been extra work to support them, and I figured that over the years they would disappear anyway. <clears throat> and turns out I was right. I rarely try to make predictions about technology, but I did it that once. <clears throat> so then I asked people to help, and I gave it the name GNU, because that was the traditional kind of naming to use if you made something similar to something existing, you would give it a recursive acronym name, saying that this one is not the other. So GNU stands for GNU's not Unix. It's a way of giving credit to Unix for its technical ideas, whilst at the same time stating the most important thing about the system, it's not Unix, because Unix is proprietary. What good is that? We couldn't use Unix, we couldn't use any piece of Unix, because it was all proprietary. So we had to replace everything. Now, this extended from things like the kernel, the compiler, to games. One of the things that I recruited someone for in the 1980s was, was to make a chess game for you know. So, an operating system like Unix will include all these different levels of things. Of course, I was looking at Berkeley Unix, BSD, proprietary, but it was the better version of Unix compared with AT&T's version. So, <clears throat> GNU is not a collection of tools. GNU is an operating system that it includes all sorts of programs that users might enjoy or find useful for anything. But as I looked around for people to write or for existing free programs I could use for various jobs, because not invented here wasn't part of the, wasn't the goal, you know. It, we didn't have, it, this, it didn't have to be a system in which every piece was written for the GNU project. It had to be a system in which every piece was free. <clears throat> So I found people to write some things, and I also looked for starting points. You know, my first attempt at a compiler was based on something called Pastel, which had been developed at Livermore Lab, and they gave me a copy, and I eventually concluded it was useless as a starting point. But I wanted to start with something existing so it would take less time to get it running, because <clears throat> Again, my goal wasn't to have a compiler which I had written all of. My goal was to have a compiler that was free and that did the job and that we could use so that I could work on some other piece. It was a very big job after all. So big that many people thought it was hopeless. <clears throat> and over and over again, I looked for some starting point and most of those starting points turned out not to be any good and had to be totally eliminated, but I hoped that they would save some time. <clears throat> when I had a program that was ready for actual release, and the first one was GNU Emacs, I needed a license to release it with. And that's when I developed the concept of copyleft. It was to prevent a problem I had already seen, specifically in the case of Tech. Now, Tech was free software that existed before the GNU project. 
Uh, the current version of Tech was released in 1982. Well, I only started you know, in January 84. So that's one still useful piece of free software that existed before GNU. But its license permitted modified proprietary versions, in effect. And as a result, these modified proprietary versions existed. What I saw was that someone could take Knuth's work make some changes and produce a proprietary executable. And the fact that it had some relation, maybe even 99% of it came from Knuth's free source code, did us no good at all. So proprietary changes in a free program can ruin everything. I had to find a way to prevent that. And what I developed is copyleft. You can think of it as copyright flipped over. And here's how it works. First I said, this program is copyrighted, with a copyright notice. And then I said, but you have the freedom to run it, ch just study it, change it, and distribute copies with or without changes. But there is a condition. When you distribute any of this material, the entire work you put it into has to be under this same license. In other words, copyleft tells the middleman, no, you can't convert this effectively into proprietary software, no matter what you do. You're not allowed to. You can change it if you like, but your changes can't be an excuse to make it proprietary. Your change has to be under this same license, too. And legally this works because to incorporate any of this code that I wrote into some other work, the author of that other work needs my permission. Well, my permission is granted only under this condition. So he's not allowed to use my code at all if he doesn't accept this condition. It's copyright infringement. Nowadays, I'm not the copyright holder of GCC or any of the, those other you know, packages that we're here to discuss. The Free Software Foundation is, in most cases, but it still works the same. It's just that the Free Software Foundation is in a better position to enforce these conditions. And just once, we had to go so far as to actually sue someone. Uh, most of the time, we get redistributors to comply without having to go so far. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, the GNU General Public License, which implements copyleft, has limits imposed by what copyright law says. You know, we couldn't put in any sort of condition we might like. And there are certain issues which are somewhat fuzzy in the law, that it's not clear how far we can actually make the copyleft requirements extend. And therefore, we need to be careful. Because there are people who would like to build non-free programs that would enhance GCC especially, and if we were not careful, GCC might change from a compiler that people actually use into a sort of platform for non-free software. And the thing people actually used would be some combination of GCC and non-free programs. Well, this would be total, this might look like success of a kind for GCC, but when we look at the GNU system, and the purpose of the GNU system, which is to give people freedom, it would be failure. So we've got to stop this from happening. For a long time, I wouldn't allow GCC to support plugins because I wasn't sure if we could firmly prevent those plugins from being non-free. Well, we worked out mechanisms to achieve that, 
and now GCC has a plug-in mechanism. But this is absolutely crucial if we want the overall project to be a success. The danger still exists. You've probably heard of Apache. Apache is free software. It's released under a free software license called the Apache license. Apache Software License 2.0. Well, it's a free license, but it doesn't do copyleft, which means it permits distribution of proprietary executables made from Apache. And in fact, a large fraction of the users are using proprietary modified versions. When you see figures for what fraction of web servers are running Apache, I think they include the proprietary versions. But if you were to count how many web server operators get the freedom that the original Apache comes with, it's not so many. Because the ones who run a proprietary version, they're not getting the freedom. So the problem that copyleft it was invented to, to prevent is still real. And we can't afford to ignore it. So that's the reason for some inconvenient measures that we sometimes take. They're inconvenient if you think of the goal as simply how to make this tool more popular and get used more. But if you look at the overall goal, why do we want these programs? They're part of the GNU system. And why do we want the GNU system? It's to give people freedom. Then you can understand why these method measures are necessary. Now, I had a technical idea in the 1980s, one that was almost realized, but never really got going. I wanted to make it possible to look at a C program inside Emacs and type control meta x on one function and have that, the current version of that function as it is in your source code, go into your program immediately without having to uh, rebuild it and restart it or anything like that. You know, control meta x is the command you type on a list function to have Emacs read that def button and immediately Emacs starts using the changed version of that function. It's very convenient for debugging. Well, I thought that we should have the same convenience in debugging compiled languages. So, I came up with a design that's rather complicated which involves several GNU programs that would have to change. The first one was GCC. GCC needed a way to compile and quickly produce some sort of uh, byte code. And the idea was that it would also have the feature to compile, well, it would look at the whole file, but it would only compile a certain function or functions that it had been told were supposed to be changed. Then there needed to be a way to dynamically load those into a job and replace the, you know, patch those functions so that they would call back the replacements using the C interpreter. And then we needed a GDB to be able to take the output of GCC, which contained a few functions in byte mode, and stick that into the job so that it would run as patched. Now this is just recreating the convenience that we had when we programmed in assembler language in the 1970s. You could have your, your program under DDT, you could patch some instructions. Uh, DDT had, had it, our version of DDT had uh, an assembler in it so that you could, you could insert instructions and you could patch your program and continue it. Well, you could patch the kernel and continue it if it crashed. 
And we did it. If you had, if you, if the system crashed and you had been typing in your editor for an hour and you didn't want to lose that, well, you would figure out how to patch it and make it start up again. So, uh, why don't we have this convenience in using C? Well, I found someone to write a C interpreter, and the uh, and something in GCC to produce the bytecodes. But that's as far as it got. Well, maybe there's a, a different design that would be better today. But we ought to have this facility. So people, let's make it happen. At this point, I think it's time to auction the adorable Gnu. <laughs> this is an adorable Gnu that needs a home. And I'm going to auction it on behalf of the Free Software Foundation. If you buy the Gnu, I can sign the card for you. <laughs> and, or I can sign this label for you if you like. And if you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin. <laughs> As we all know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we can accept payment in, with cash or with credit cards. And I will conduct the auction in euros, but I can accept the equivalent amount of Krona instead. Uh, and I'm going to start at 20 euros. Do I get 20 euros? How much? I've got 20. Please shout the amount you're bidding. I've got 20. Do I get 25? I've got 20. I've got 25. Do I get 30? I'll make it 100. 100. Ah, I've got 100 euros. Do I get 110? Do I get 110? I've got 100 euros. Do I get 110 for this historical canoe? How much? I've got 110. Do I get 120? I've got 110. Do I get 120 for this adorable? I'll make it 150. How much? 150. I've got 150. Do I get 160? I've got 150. Do I get 160 for this adorable? 160 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Do I get 160? Last chance. 160. 160. 160. Even 150. Do I get 160? Last chance. Going. Going, gone for 150. <laughs> so now, if you like, I will present my other identity.
Today in the Church of Emacs, we have no services, only software. <laughs> we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs, and we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> Of a true expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant part of our sacred scriptures, in other words, the system source code. <laughs> now, in the Church of Emacs, we have abolished the priesthood of technology because all of the faithful are welcome to read our sacred scriptures. We also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs. The Virgin of Emacs is anyone who has never used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the Virgin the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. <laughs> we also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> There is a Tibetan sect which considers that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of the script. However, the mainstream church believes that in order to get spiritual merit from this pilgrimage, you must type them by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> so if you've been searching everywhere for a church to be saintly and you might consider ours. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control. And then install a wholly free operating system. <laughs> and then only install and use free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo, if you can find one, because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> Some have asked whether, according to the Church of Emacs, it is a sin to use the other editor, VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast, <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and some have asked whether my halo was really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous life. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>
can help is don't use terms open and closed in discussing software. And I suggest that you be totally firm in this. Even if other, if someone asks you a question or poses, a, makes a statement in those terms, respond first by distancing yourself from those terms, and then talk about freedom respecting free software or user subjugating proprietary software. Now, most languages have a word that's better than free. It's a disadvantage of English. Uh, the word free. Refer, has a meaning that refers to freedom and another that refers to price. We're not talking about price. You're perfectly welcome to sell or buy copies of free software, and some of you do. So, okay, we want to make that clear. Well, how do you make that clear? One is to say it's free as in free speech, not as in free beer. Uh, another that we sometimes do is to use the French or Spanish word uh, or libre, or in English you might pronounce it libre, but it's written L-I-B-R-E. When you're speaking some other language, use your language's word. If your language has a better word than the English free, one that only refers to freedom and doesn't talk about price, always use that. Don't use the English word free software. Make things as clear as you can. Now, I should point out that using the word open doesn't fix this. It's actually worse. Most people who hear the term, quote, open source, unquote, immediately think of a meaning, which is the term's natural meaning, which is you can look at the source, but it doesn't imply you could do anything beyond that. Now, that's not the definition that the people who use that term gave. Their definition is pretty close to our definition of free software. <coughs> Unfortunately, not equivalent. They accept some licenses that we consider too restrictive. And not only that, they ignore the issue of tyrant devices that refuse to let the user change the software at all. So uh, their definition is definitely not equivalent to ours, but it was intended to be pretty close. But no, almost nobody knows that, because they all think the term means what it naturally appears to mean. So, whereas it's possible to misunderstand, quote, free software, unquote, until it's been explained to you which of the two natural meanings it has, quote, open source, unquote, people almost always follow its natural meaning, which is only one, and it's wrong. So, don't think that that term helps anything. And, uh, um, <clears throat> I think it was, uh, Dewar, what first pointed out to me how if you're trying to convince people other than techies, the practical advantage arguments of open source don't matter to them. I mean, especially if you're trying to convince users, they can judge for themselves how convenient or how reliable a program is. Arguments that because we made it in this way, it's going to tend to be more reliable, they don't care. They'll judge for themselves if it's reliable. Uh, but on the other hand, they may never have thought about respect for their freedom before. So if we talk to them about that, we might even convince them to use the program. So I have met many people who are free software activists, although they are not programmers. They're not geeks. They're interested in free software because they recognize the unjust power that non-free software gives to some company over them. And one thing that the last 10 years of history should have taught us is that letting companies have power over people is extremely dangerous. Now, I don't want to abolish companies or abolish business, but we mustn't let companies have power over us. What do they do? They poison us, they rob us, and they fry our planet. They're doing all these things now. And the reason is that we didn't keep the lid on them with democracy. Now, the idea of democracy is that the many who are not rich together govern, and they keep rich people from having enough influence to control the laws and use the government against most people. Today, most
most of the developed world is democratic in form only. Democracy is not functioning because corporations, mainly the big ones, have got control over the governments and they even mostly buy the laws. So we have to make democracy work again and free software turns out to be one aspect of that.
you can. You can. There's there's no harm in that if you want to do that. We've been trying to do that for at least two years in GCC. And it's been denied. Can you tell us why? I don't think so, but I'll look back over that. I don't remember. I remember that we discussed it, discussed things about certain documentation that needed to be used in two contexts, and uh, I gave you a solution. I did not hear anything. What? I, 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 prov I provided a solution. Now people in the GCC steering committee wasn't very happy with it, but it will work. It, which basically was to to effectively do a license that part of the text. But it, it requires someone in a position of power to, to do the, the cross licensing, which didn't, doesn't really respect. I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid I can't hear you well, but we don't have time to discuss this issue here. But maybe there's a chance to discuss it today because I have to look and see the details. The problem is talking about this in those terms, it requires me to remember exactly what proposals were discussed, and I don't remember. I have to look it up. The Free Software Foundation owns a copyright for code and documentation, which is yes. in a license. Uh, sorry, so that's, that's, sorry. That's maybe the last question because we're right no, but Yes, we have the copyright, and we can, in fact, release it under both licenses. So and that's what I said we should do. <laughs> I can't hear you at all. We need the free software foundation to uh, do this to a licensing of the GCC code. Yes, but anyone who changes it can do that for his change also. Well, this is not the forum to have this particular issue, which I agree is an issue, but this is not the place. Well, I'll be around for some hours more and we can talk about this if people want to arrange a meeting. There's anyway, a, now it's time to, we've got some s merchandise to sell. Jose, would you like to sell it? <laughs> I can't hear you very well. Yes. Okay, so here's the stuff. Maybe we should give them a bit more space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have another room. So, do we have a break now? There's a break now until uh, until eleven, and we we'll start the next uh, the next talk at eleven. So, uh, folks, people are stickers, take stickers, please. The stickers are these stickers are gratis. Yeah, this is the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Send me, send me the, the PDF on the, on the slides so I can put them on the wiki as, um, as, as a reminder of, the, of these meetings. Uh, I, was, I was thinking of taking notes, but um, last year it worked in London. I don't think we'll have the bandwidth this year to take notes on uh, as we go. So, yeah, well, you can try it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, we'd, like to, we'd like to thank Richard for coming to talk to us.